last uh, week, we held another event uh, similar to this uh, devoted to, to the uh, Turkmen minority in uh, Iraq. The theme of uh, national minorities, ethnic groups, uh, is um, very important uh, for us, uh, the Nonviolent Radical Party. We devoted most of our activities uh, to human rights uh, issues, and uh, we have uh, a long story of uh, interaction and cooperation with uh, the UN uh, mechanism, and uh, um, we uh, support uh, every possible uh, initiative of uh, dialogue, uh, with uh, peaceful, non-violent uh, methods among uh, individuals, national groups, ethnic groups, minorities, states, and uh, within uh, the system of uh, the United Nations. Uh, for this reason, we have uh, the consultative status as an international NGO with uh, the UN uh, ECOSOC, and uh, uh, many times we have been here in the premises uh, of uh, the United Nations Human Rights Council uh, to put together people of different nationalities and uh, uh, to have a dialogue with uh, their states and the international community as a whole. So I'm glad to, to start uh, immediately our uh, event uh, of today, giving the floor to Hillel Neuer, who is the executive director of uh, UN Watch, a human rights NGO here in uh, Geneva. Uh, she uh, taught international human rights at the Geneva School uh, of uh, Diplomacy and in 2008 was elected vice president of the Conference of NGOs Special Committee on Human Rights. So, Hillel, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and I congratulate you on organizing this uh, timely and important panel. Could not be more timely. Iran has an election coming up in a few days. We call it an election, but it's not an election how we might know it here in Geneva, where we have elections very often and referendums, or in Switzerland, or in Canada, where I come from, uh, or in most countries in Europe. This is not an election where uh, any person who wishes to run for election can submit their name and run. Actually, it's, uh, it's the opposite. There is a dictator who decides who can run, and, uh, and many uh, individuals who, who try to run were, were denied, were vetoed. And so in the end, you have uh, a so-called election, uh, a number of names on a ballot, names who've been weeded out, who conform to the uh, dictates of, of the regime. Uh, and wh while we have this election coming up, it is uh, vital that we understand how Iran is treating its minorities. And in that regard, uh, I have very little that I could add to what the uh, experts will say on the specific uh, experiences they've had in their own personal lives or with groups that they, that they work with. Uh, but I, I can add something about what the international community is doing, what we here at the United Nations are doing, in particular here at the Human Rights Council and in the human rights system. Um, and uh, I want to begin by looking at what, what's been happening in New York and then uh, say a word or two about what's happening here in Geneva and what, what, we, what we need to be doing as human rights activists on the international scene to help the individuals and groups that we're going to hear from today. Now, in New York, as, as you may know, the General Assembly uh, adopts, for some years now, has been adopting an annual resolution on the situation of human rights in Iran. This is uh, typically led by Canada and supported by other democracies. In recent years, it's got increased support. And this resolution is a very strong resolution. I think uh, the, the, those who work uh, on this resolution, we have activists in this room who have been very active on these issues for a number of years. Uh, can take credit for, for succeeding in getting uh, a very detailed resolution. And I'm, and I'm holding in my hands Resolution 67-182. It's the most recent resolution um, adopted uh, by the General Assembly. It was just adopted in December uh, of 2012. Now, this resolution documents in significant detail uh, Iran's gross and systematic human rights violations. And there are specific reference to the issues that we're addressing today on, on minorities. And I want to read to you just a few of those so you know uh, where the United Nations stands, where the United Nations is on record on these issues. I'm referring to paragraph 2, uh, section I, J, and K, which refers specifically to the issues of minorities. And it ref refers to and itemizes continued discrimination and other human rights violations, at times amounting to persecution, against Arabs, Azeris, Baluchis, Kurds, 
ethnic Arabs and Azeris, and refers also to the uh, secret group execution of the Ahwazi Arab minority. There is reference in section J to persecution against uh, religious minorities, including Christians, Jews, Sufi Muslims, Sunni Muslims, and Zoroastrians. And we heard about Zoroastrian, uh, uh, my uh, friend Marina Nimad, who's just speaking to me, who's a survivor of torture, spoke about one of her friends who was uh, victimized in Iran, who was a Zoroastrian, a childhood friend of hers. She just testified moments ago uh, before the United Nations uh, Human Rights Council uh, upstairs. And the resolution also refers to uh, the arrest, widespread arrest and detention of Sufi Muslims, evangelical Christians, and the continued detention of Christian pastors. And Marina spoke about uh, uh, some of these pastors uh, uh, earlier as well at the United Nations. Uh, finally, the, there's specific reference to the persecution uh, of the Baha'i. Uh, escalating attacks and increase in the number of arrests and detentions, restriction of access to higher education on the basis of religion, sentencing of 12 Baha'is associated with Baha'i educational institutions to lengthy prison terms, denial of access to employment in the public sector, and additional restrictions on their participation in the private sector, and de facto criminalization of membership in the Baha'i faith. So all of this is documented, itemized, detailed uh, at the United Nations General Assembly. Uh, and I think, I think that's something that anyone who's active on these issues ne needs, to, needs to be aware of. There are other references uh, in the document to uh, Baluchis uh, and other minorities. So that, th these are some of the important issues that are being addressed uh, by the annual resolution uh, in New York. Now here in Geneva, we've had some progress, but we are far from where we need to be. The United Nations Human Rights Council initially was uh, uh, resistant to addressing the issue in Iran. We first had a cross-regional statement by many countries. Uh, finally, a couple of years ago, this led to a, uh, the first resolution of the Human Rights Council on Iran, and there was the creation of a special rapporteur. So we now have a special rapporteur here in, um, in uh, the Human Rights Council on Iran. That's important. Uh, but the, the resolution, if you compare the resolution, and I'm just going to show you visually, uh, the, the resolution in New York um, is multiple pages and it's in, in some detail on all the issues that I described, okay? Um, and you, you fast forward to Geneva, and you have one page, and all the, the detailed violations are absent. There is reference to the rapporteur. There is an expression of serious concern at the developments noted in his report. Um, and there's criticism of Iran, but it's, it is so mild and modest and sterile compared to the, uh, the resolution in New York. So I think... Uh, we have something here in Geneva at the Human Rights Council, but we, uh, there's no reason, there's no objective reason, there's political reasons. Politically, this was very hard to get this resolution adopted. Before this year, you couldn't even get a majority, you had a plurality, but not a majority that would support this resolution. Um, but the text is, is uh, really uh, puny compared to what we have in New York, and I think that's a challenge for human rights activists dealing on the issues. And I think uh, if we look at who voted for the resolution, um, this time we did get a majority, but we had certain countries, India, a great democracy, which abstained. I think that's shameful. Uh, Philippines abstained. That's shameful as well. And I think we, we need to uh, shame the countries who either vote no or abstain on these texts. Uh, finally, I wanna, I wanna say a few words about the human rights community, uh, the NGO community. Uh, we need to understand what Iran is doing and, and not be naive about it. And Iran is, is speaking at the Human Rights Council every day, at every session, not just in its own name, but twice. It speaks again as the current head of the non-aligned movement. That's a 120 nation strong group, the largest block of nations at the United Nations. Their spokesman today is Iran. At every agenda item, Iran takes the floor as one of the first countries and speaks on behalf of this group. Um, it, it is to the shame of the non-aligned movement that they allow Iran to be their spokesperson. And, and it should be noted that Iran uses its membership in Nam to promote a false narrative, a specious narrative. And that is the narrative that Iran is a champion of human rights. A couple of years ago, Iran created a center on so-called human rights and diversity. And it appears here on human rights and cultural diversity. Uh, it, it follows a Nam summit, non-aligned movement summit that was in Tehran uh, in, in 2007, a ministerial meeting. And they created in Tehran this cultural center. I know there was an activist in Geneva, an Iranian individual who was recruited to work at that center. He found it to be a sham. Uh, it was a, a shill for the regime, and, and he left that center. Um, 
the center uh, is supposedly dedicated to the Tehran Declaration and Program of Action that was adopted in 2007 by the non-aligned movement. If you read that program of action, it is a thinly veiled attack on the idea that human rights are universal. So although they may acknowledge universality, in fact, this whole notion of cultural diversity is meant to do the opposite. Now, cultural diversity ought to protect individuals, the kind of individuals we have today, and on their diversity. But this non-aligned movement text on cultural diversity is used as a shield for the regimes. The regimes say that you have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but we have our own systems of government. We do things differently. So perhaps in your countries in the West, you don't torture people. Well, we have our way of doing things. And that is why Iran, Zimbabwe, China, all embrace this idea of cultural diversity. It's not to protect the minorities that you'll hear from today. We already know how they're being treated and you'll hear about it today. But it's to give the regimes immunity to say that we do things our way and therefore our governments should be immune from scrutiny. That is the gist of this text which talks about the significance of national particularities. It's not to help their minorities. It's to give the regime immunity. And they refer to historical, various historical, cultural and religious backgrounds. Again, it's, it's the implicit concept was that the world should give a free pass to the oppressive rulers, be they in Iran, Syria, Cuba, China, or Zimbabwe. Um, and so this center is operating. They have conferences. They publish material. The head of the center is someone who used to be a representative of, of the Iran's diplomatic corps, a regime uh, uh, operative, who did a doctorate in Ireland and then went back to Tehran to head the center. And they do some legitimate human rights activities. But then, of course, when the center was created, the foreign minister of Iran said that the whole purpose was to uh, fight the West. Um, I'm going to give uh, a quote. Um, speaking at its uh, May opening, uh, this is uh, two years ago, so in May 2011, the uh, Iran's deputy foreign minister said that one of the center's core messages is that the Iranian government is, quote, a victim. The Iran government is a victim of the politicization of human rights. So Iran government is a victim of the politicization of human rights, even though, quote, they have always played a leading role in promoting uh, human values. Well, you can ask the people in Evan Prison and the survivors of torture, and they will give you a, a very different story. Uh, the, the current director of the center, as I mentioned, his name is Kamran Hashemi, a former political office with Iran's foreign ministry. He says that Sharia law offers ideal protections for Jews and other minorities. Yet uh, his predecessor and many of the center's lecturers emanate from the Iranian regime's foreign ministry. I think we need to know what the center is about. And we need to know about it here in Geneva because sadly, there are some international authorities who are doing business and legitimizing this sham center. One of them, sadly, is here across the street from us, the ICRC. The International Committee for the Red Cross was a co-sponsor of uh, 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 a number of conferences held by this uh, center. Uh, also, an individual who's a leading professor named William Shabis, who used to head the uh, Irish Center for Human Rights and recently moved to England, is teaching in an English school as a leading authority in international criminal law. He has lent his name to this uh, center as well. Indeed, it's his PhD student who heads the center. Uh, at a time when the Iranian regime continues to arrest, beat, and rape its own citizens, and when the universality of human rights remains tenuous in too many countries, to think that the International Red Cross and Professor William Shabis would legitimize this kind of insidious project is mind-boggling. So I think there's a, a lot of work uh, that we in the international human rights community need to do to uh, help the victims in Iran and to make sure that their government doesn't escape scrutiny with phony human rights initiatives, whether it's here at the Human Rights Council in Geneva or whether it's back home in Tehran. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Regine, and also because uh, you put the accent uh, on a very important and very delicate issue, that is uh, the one uh, of uh, universality versus originalism uh, in uh, human rights. Uh, I studied this issue, and uh, actually Iran is uh, uh, one of the countries that uh, does uh, its worst uh, against the normal, what should be the normal correct interpretation of uh, universal uh, human rights. Uh, now I will give uh, the floor to the second speaker, who is Mr. Karim Abdian, the director of the Iraq's Education and Human Rights uh, Foundation. Uh, he, uh, this is an international advocacy NGO in support of national and ethnic uh, minorities uh, in Iran. With a focus on uh,
was the Arabs in the southwest of the country. And he's also the Secretary of International and Foreign Affairs of the Congress of Nationalities for the Federal Iran. So, uh, Mr. Abiyans, you have the floor. Thank you. I think this is on, is it? Yeah. Yes, thank you very much, Antonia. And I would like to thank UNPO and the Nonviolent uh, Radical Party for organizing and supporting this very important event in this very juncture uh, of our country. Uh, yes, uh, yes, we do have an election in Iran, June 14, this Friday. Uh, however, uh, as it was mentioned, uh, the election is neither fair nor free. The uh, more than a, th a thousand people who registered with the Ministry of Interior a uh, few weeks ago, about seven plus hundred were qualified, and this list was sent to the Guardian Council, a non-elected body, out of which, after the vetting process, eight were selected to run as candidates, and that's what we have, eight. Uh, aside from Mr. Arif and Mr. Rouhani, all of these are from the uh, conservative wing of the Islamic Republic. Even Mr. Rouhani and Mr. Uh, Arif are some, you know, some say are reformers, wannabes. At any rate, the point here is that uh, one percent of the regist of the qualified uh, uh, staunch reporters, uh, supporters of the regime were allowed to run. Now, that is in addition to the women in Iran are banned, constitutionally are banned from the election. And non-Shiites are banned, again, constitutionally from the election. Now, that is all the Sunnis, about 20% of the country, all of the Baluch, all the Turkmens, all the half of the Arabs, all the Kurds are excluded. And in, uh, on top of that, the, the uh, religious minorities are excluded. Christians, uh, Jews, Baha'is, Zoroastrians, Mandanis, Sahabis are. So that is the point here is the, uh, that shows the exclusiveness or lack, lack of it with, with this process. So uh, the, uh, and then we had the disqualification of Hashmi Rafsanjani and Esfandiyara Mashai. Rafsanjani represent the mercantile class of Iran, the bazaar, a backbone of the economy. Uh, also, he represent the uh, moderate clergy in Qom and Tehran, uh, a, an art architect of the uh, Islamic Republic. He was disqualified. Incidentally, when I was in the jail during the Shah in 1970s, Hashmi Rafsanjani was there in Evin. So this person was da uh, disqualified. And uh, uh, Mashai, an interesting character, he and Ahmadinejad in the past several years introduced a very, uh, an idea that uh, somewhat uh, a new uh, Persian uh, nationalism, they believe that the uh, religion appeal, the religious religion has lost its appeal in Iran, so they thought to infuse nationalism in that because they thought the system, the Islamic Republic is not tenable based upon religion alone. So, and he was qualified. At any rate, the point here is that uh, the, the uh, disqualification of Rafsanjani and Mashai literally has taken, dampened the enthusiasm and took the vigor what could have been perhaps a somewhat uh, exciting uh, election. It isn't. Um, so the, uh, the bottom line is the election has been engineered, preconceived by the Velayat of Faqih with the consent and the consensus of the military and the uh, revolutionary guards. Uh, all uh, eight, uh, the, the three front runners of the eight, Jalali, Velayati, and Mahbalwak, Literally, there isn't a difference, political difference between them, you know? So that is just a, a, a plot to show the international community that there is more, more than one candidate. Uh, so uh, it doesn't really matter which one of them. I'm willing to bet on Jalili, but, but anyway, it doesn't matter which one of them is represented. The next 
Mr. President, uh, uh, first of all, the, so far, so far the, the message has been clear that no opposition is tolerated, that the people's votes are totally irrelevant, and thanks to the oil money, there isn't a constituent voter block that they can, so they don't need the, 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 the people. Uh, and, you know, interestingly, in the past two debates of the eight candidates, they did not debate the social and political problems, the economy, the unemployment, the poverty, the isolation, but it was debated who was most effective in suppressing dissent, especially in 2009 and 2003. At any rate, so this 12th uh, presidential election has been one of the least competitive among all. Now, whoever is elected, this is what this president is facing in the next four years, okay? Internationally, it's, it, uh, the government faces t almost total isolation, increasing sanction, drop in the oil export from almost $2 million to the lately of 700,000 barrels per day, and of course, the standoff on the inter uh, nuclear issues. And domestically, however, this is what they are. They are faced, this president faced with the ruined economy uh, in the verge of collapse, sanctions, huge unemployment, deep devaluation of the currency, the real, lack of in immobility for the youth, a big sector of the society, the, uh, the common frustration that all college graduates in Iran share is that they will not have a job. And of course, poverty, drug addiction, and polarization of the society along ha the haves, small haves, and the have-nots. But in my opinion, the most formidable, the existential challenge for the regime comes from the non-dominant ethnic groups. You know, uh, we all know that Iran is one of the most, perhaps, diverse country of the Middle East. There are at least six major ethnic groups, the Persians, Arab, Kurds, Turkmen, Kurds, Balu, Talishi, and on and on, and, and, and diversity in, in religion. However, for whatever reason, that's not, I'm not gonna go into it, but the country has been ruled by only one of these constituent nationalities. For instance, Persian uh, or Farsi has been the sole language, official language, in a country that you may have 30 million Turks or 10 million Kurds, or Baluch and Arabs and so on. So the, uh, there has been a, a huge <coughs> national awakening among these nationalities that they want their rightful place in the society but the system disallowed them. It disallowed them during the Pahlavi regime. It's disallowing them now. So, so this, uh, uh, the internet, the satellite TV has called these people uh, to, to uh, rebel and assert themselves like never before. Now, there hasn't been any mechanism to address these issues not only among the regime, but unfortunately among the opposition. So uh, I, I, I am willing here to say that if this issue is not addressed, among all the other problems, Iran is facing strife, perhaps civil war, and maybe even balkanization along the ethnic lines. This is people, some of us uh, uh, involved very much in, in this, you know, I am an Arab from Iran and I know what goes on in the, uh, uh, in the Arab areas. There is uh, an insurgency going on at various levels, but especially in the Arab areas, in the Baluch and Kurdish areas. And, and from nonviolent to, uh, to, to uh, uh, armed struggle and, um, Unfortunately, the regime has been, uh, it's used iron fist uh, uh, for any sort of dissent so far. I can tell you the representative of most nationalities are here. I can tell you 
about the uh, Al Ahwaz or Ahwazi Arabs that, uh, you know, uh, where he le left, uh, he mentioned the five uh, uh, executions that were con condemned by all uh, special rapporteurs. You know, we have five high school teachers. Mr. Shabani, Mr. Amuri, Mr. Haydari, and two uh, Al Bushekeb brothers. These people have never done anything wrong. They are not even political activists. They were sentenced to death, and their execution is about to be carried out any day. Now, what they did, they have uh, started an organization called Al Hawar, Dialogue. Interestingly, I've been uh, and, and, and again, I address the Iranian regime here from this tribune and everybody. I put my over 40 years of human rights activists in these halls that these people have not done anything wrong, yet they were accused of uh, uh, being against what the security of the state and everything, and they were executed. The Al Hawar that they ran, it was an NGO that helped. Arab uh, uh, kids to, to uh, you know, in, in the Arab areas, you have 75% dropout in high school. It's an amazing thing. So they were helping these poor kids to stay in school. They were helping families, mothers who are, uh, uh, or husbands or wives or sons were executed, political prisoners and so on. Yet these people were uh, sentenced to death by the Ahwaz Revolutionary Court, and the Supreme Court uh, 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 approved that. Now, the point here for this community is that should, and this is the last window that were open to the civil society. If this window is closed and is closing very fast, then you will have violence. You will have people. Uh, reaching the conclusion that there, especially among Arab, Kurds, Baluch, that look, we cannot live with this regime, and it seems nobody is listening to us. So the, uh, uh, you know, uh, I have been read, uh, reading report that uh, Iranian Arabs, Ahwazi Arabs have been fighting in Syria along the Syrian opposition against the, uh, uh, against the uh, Bashar al-Assad regime. You see the, uh, the, the connection. In other words, you know, you cannot, uh, you know, under dictatorship in Iran, you cannot do anything, so you have to go to uh, Syria to, uh, to, to fight. Uh, and uh, my reference here is that the next four years, at best, if no event happens in the next few days or post-election, okay, uh, among the other challenges, this challenge is there. You know, 2009 election, something happened. And, and, and uh, about two, three million Iranians poured in the streets of Tehran. Well, what happened? We never had this many people in any of the Arab Springs. Not even half a million people came to the street. How come? They won and in Iran. What happened? This, this question was posed to, the, to uh, Mir Hossein Musavi, to Karubi, to all the leadership of the Green Movement. Four years later, they have not responded to this question. But here it is. The reason the movement was suppressed, for one, it was confined to Tehran, but most importantly, that platform did not reflect the aspiration of the Arabs, of the Kurds, of the Talishi, of the Baluchis, and all the others. So Azerbaijan stayed, stayed on the sidelines, Kurds stayed on the sidelines, right? Now, it's, we're not here to debate that right or wrong, but their particip uh, lack of participation, you know, uh, 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 put this movement in Tehran under the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, 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 it was suppressed. So then, without the participation of this, by some account, a two-third of Iran, 
uh, and this was said by the current minister or deputy minister of, of education, that 75% of the students who enter Iran today, their mother language is non-Farsi, non-Persian. That's the reality. So, you know, even if half of the population are non-Persian, you have an exclusion of half of the society, women, religious minorities, and is that tenable? If it were, then all these dictators were here, Saddam Hussein, Stalin, Hitler, and all. So I'm here to say that this is not tenable, okay, in a country as diverse, you know, for whatever reason, the, the uh, ethnic uh, minorities or nationalities uh, are excluded. I was asked to, uh, you know, to, to uh, comment about Syria too. Despite all these problems, you see that Iranian regime pours tens of billions of dollars to maintain the Assad regime. Why? What is Iran doing there when you have that kind of problems? The problem, the, the Iran's presence is geopolitical, is strategic. It's not there to support the Alevite. The Alevite and their normal circumstances would be called heretics. You know, they're not really that kind of Shia. But Iran is there to support its terrorist network out of Damascus. Read an, a, an article by Mr. Adel Asadinia, like myself, an Arab Iranian who was the Iranian consul general in, in, in Dubai for five years, then became the Iranian ambassador in Portugal, and he uh, defected. He lives in Sweden. He has an article in The, uh, mm -hmm. in, in the Guardian. He says that Iranian planes literally bring tons of money to Syria, and from there, it's been distributed to all their proxies. So Iran is in Syria to support Hezbollah, because if Syria is gone, then you don't have the roads to, 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 to ship arm, uh, uh, arms to Hezbollah, the, the, their main proxies, uh, because Syria is the spring forth for Iran to influence the Arab world, the Islamic world. It is funny that a country with all those problems is expanding like an empire. So the, uh, uh, the uh, current presence of Iran uh, in, 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 uh, in Syria uh, shows that, uh, again, you know, m what I'm driving is the, the fact that this regime cannot ma be maintained. Uh, it's not tenable at this situation, uh, 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 at the current, uh, 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 with the current policies. The other aspect is that uh, the Palestinian issue, I guess it was interesting mm -hmm. that Iran uses the non-aligned movement and the Palestinian issue to influence the, uh, the Arab world. Now, uh, the, uh, the Shiite regime uh, uh, Shiite regime of Iraq, rather, the al maliki is currently directly involved in Syria. Lebanon is directly involved in Syria. Uh, Jordan somehow is directly involved, uh, indirectly, and Turkey. Iran will be, will be involved one way or the other. And if the Kurds in Syria would want independence, you would think, why the Kurds in Iran wouldn't want independence? Has anybody in Iran, inside the government or outside the government, has put forward a solution, a system of governance inclusive enough to have all the minorities, ethnic and religion, religious, to be present in the government? It hasn't. Federalism has been uh, 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 proposed many times. So, so, but the point here is that uh, uh, this is an issue not only for Iran, but like Iran, all the uh, diverse countries, Syria, Turkey, Lebanon, and, and so on and so forth. But uh, in Iran, I think we have it the worst. 
because uh, Arabs are being, this year we had 11 public execution among the Arab areas. There were 35 execution in Karun prison. And fortunately, Iranian NGOs and human rights organization did not even or did not mention them or didn't give them the, the coverage. Okay, in, in Kurdistan, we had the same thing. So this, I think, will exacerbate to a point then that, you know, and if it happens, then the international community or the Iranian opposition cannot say that they were ignorant, that they were not told that, you know, that, that, that we have this uh, type of situation. Uh, and, and with that, hopefully, uh, we can continue, I guess one of our friends here from Etihad of Fadayan, he was telling me that he wants to, uh, you know, uh, bring this very issue, hopefully during the question and answer, we can go into it uh, uh, more in depth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Abdian. And now I will give the floor to Mr. Abdullah Hezab who is a representative of the Iranian Kurdistan and uh, a member of the UNPO presidency. Please, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, I'm totally uh, agree with uh, what Mr. Abedian said here, and his presentation of the situation in Iran is, uh, is um, covering uh, what we are witnessing in Iran today. My topic is about uh, the difficult path towards changes in Iran. Uh, and I'm not going to, to mention the situation for human rights, the conditions for human rights in Iran, uh, but uh, some structural difficulties we have in this country towards changes. In spite of what Mr. Abedian uh, mentioned here, Iran has uh, so far managed to avoid new mass protests and uh, popular uprising. But uh, the superficial order across uh, the country indicates in no way the Islamic Republic of Iran's legitimacy or popularity among the masses. Uh, during last years, this state of order was challenged many times. Only four years ago, at the aftermath of presidential election, the so-called presidential election, uh, the streets of Tehran witnessed um, one of the most widespread popular uprisings in the region. Uh, but within a few days, the Revolutions Guard and the paramilitary Basit militia cracked down all demonstrations in Tehran and all over the country, killing dozens of uh, civilians. The Islamic Republic's war against human rights, democracy, and uh, the right of uh, unrepresented nations in the country uh, had already started in 1979 and seemed to continue without any limits. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the outcome of uh, ongoing presidential election campaign in Iran could be unpredictable, but all indicates, indicators point out that hardliners in a coalition with the Revolutions Guard and uh, the Basij militia try to channelize election to a desired direction. The way Iran's national broadcasting operates in during the election campaigns shows which uh, one of the six candidates were because uh, it was, uh, there were where eight candidates, no two of them has um, has um, retired, and uh, six of them are going to to run for presidency. Uh, and the way the national broadcasting uh, operates in, in the which one of these uh, six candidates, uh, Ali Khamenei and other high-ranking conservative clergies uh, and military commanders, are focusing on, and uh, who is preferred to be elected. Uh, however, there is no doubt that the upcoming presidential election on Friday this week uh, will not change anything else than the face of a man who are going to primarily 
serve the spiritual leader of the country for for four or eight years ahead because the legit legitimacy of government in Iran is uh, basically grounded on the rule of Sikh, uh, Sikh from leader uh, who controlled the armed forces and exercised unlimited control uh, over the internal security forces, the judiciary, the parliament, the president, and other key institutions. Whether the president in Iran is a conservative or a so-called reformist or even an ultra-conservative, neither he nor his staff are able to run a different domestic or international policy other than what uh, the spiritual leader of the regime has announced. And uh, Khamenei's messages so far are the same that always have been. So all challenges that Iran faces today, including assaults against the rights of unrepresented nations, will remain unsolved after the so-called election. Even if a so-called moderate candidate or a reformist against all odds wins the election. Dear friends, while the international community, especially uh, United States of America and the group of five plus one are concerned about Iran's ability and uh, willingness to develop nuclear weapons, the peoples of the country whom are suffering under increased oppression and uh, uncertainty are anxious about further suppression after the election. During the last eight years of Ahmadinejad's presidency, the life conditions for a majority of people have become more difficult. The prices have increased disproportionately, so does the violation against human rights especially in regions populated by Kurds, Baluchis, Arabs, Turkmens, and Azerbaijanis, and uh, for uh, religious and other uh, groups of the country. So there is no indication that a new president will run a different line. Therefore, the agenda of people of Iran is completely different from what the major powers are playing, are playing at. For the people of Iran, Cosmetic changes of Iran's behavior on international sphere is not an issue of importance. They are looking for a regime change and an opportunity to raise their voices against oppressive dictatorship of uh, clergy. So the multi-ethnic, multicultural, multinational community of Iran has never exercised any forms of democracy or rule of law. Neither the first constitution of 1906 nor the new one of 1979 gives the people a possibility to have a real influence on uh, decision-making processes. And uh, on top of all evil, the regime's strict interpretation of political schism has institutionalized discrimination against all non-Persian, non-Shia population of the country. As a consequence of uh, this approach, uh, the identity of non-Persian nationalities of the country has been systematically ignored, particularly by the Constitution of 1979, which, like the very first Constitution of the country, makes Persian, as Mr. Abedian mentioned here, uh, the official language and Shia Islam headed by a spiritual leader or Wali Fati. Uh, the official religion of the country. The few articles of Iran's constitution, uh, constitution that uh, can be used as a framework to ensure some basic cultural rights for the minorities or for non-Persian non national groups of the country, among them articles 15 and 19, have never been practiced. On the contrary, during last year's uh, unrepresented discrimi uh, unprecedented discrimination against the nation of Iran, including land and property confiscation, uh, denial of state and parastatal employment under the Guzinesh criteria, and restrictions on social and cultural linguistic rights uh, have been increased, uh, which often results on in other human rights violations. Dear participants, unrepresented nations of Iran face even more brutality when it comes to the case of human rights. 
because of uh, the constitutional restrictions they come across. Therefore, it is a very naive attitude to believe that a new president or a moderate practice of the constitution will be the right way to change Iran's behavior of the, uh, or the country's human rights record. So what the people of Iran are looking for is um, basically is a, a, a fundamental change of the political system and the political culture of the country, not only the system, but also the culture, the political culture of the country. And uh, the first step towards these kinds of changes is to challenge the constitution itself because the constitution of Iran is the main source of discrimination and violation on, uh, hum of human rights in Iran. Uh, among 175 articles and uh, the latest version of uh, our constitution uh, has 177 articles. Uh, there is only 40 articles that are more or less neutral or less, less uh, discriminatory. All other 135 or 137 articles are uh, directly or indirectly against basic human rights and the rights of people to determine their fate. Only by constitutional reforms it will be possible to limit the power of the spiritual leader, Bali Safi. A second step toward changes is to set a limit for Revolution Guard's intervention in politics and economy. The Army of the Guardians of the Islamic Revolution, or Sepahi Pastoran, is protector of the system and its spiritual leader, not the interest of the people. Therefore, the Pastoran, for the pastoran force is involved in all political process, uh, including the process of so-called presidential election. Besides, the Revolution's Guard has established a major economic cartel that estimates to have an annual revenue exceeding more than tw uh, $12 billion uh, dollar in uh, business and uh, construction. The third point is the political culture of the country. And uh, this culture is also to be challenged. The most important element of this culture, which is very unfair, discriminatory and uh, controversial is the concept of Iran's national identity because this is used by the regime and even the opposition on the basis of three elements. The first one is Iran's territory, the second one is Persian language, and the third one is Shia Islam. And Iran says the first one is Shia Islam, which is replaced by Iranian culture by more secular groups. None of those elements are inclusive for unrepresented nations of the country. One of other major barriers against the real change in Iran is deep-rooted racism reflected in the socio-political culture of dominant ruling class in Iran, which considers all non-Iranians, dated Persians, as inferior people. The spiritual leader of the regime called in a speech on May 11, 2000. 13, only for a, week ago, uh, uh, a, few, a few weeks ago, he called all Western communities, called cultures and peoples, as will people without emotions and faith, and who talking about people, people of Western countries. And only a week before him, on May the 6th, Firuz Karimi, Iranian football coach, blamed a colored football player for human eater. Insults like lizard eaters, stupid people, monkey and weird people, nations, are in official use in mass media and during the religious forecast. So the structure of unity, of unitary state, also has to be changed. Uh, the nation state model established in 19, uh, 1920s is based on discrimination and unequal distribution of benefits and burdens. Benefits go to the central areas, the burdens go to the periphery. Iran's uh, highly centralized development strategy has resulted in a wide socioeconomic gap between the center and the peripheries, where there is also an uneven distribution of power, socioeconomic resources and sociocultural structure and status. Unrepresented nations of Iran are struggling for a democratic, secular, and federal system. 
and it is a dependent of who will be new president of the country. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, the, the last uh, two uh, speeches uh, were emphasized uh, the fact that uh, in Iran, uh, whatever president uh, will be in, uh, in reality, until there is the system of the so-called Velayat e Fatut, that means the guardianship of the Islamic revolution, or the uh, supreme, uh, supreme leader, uh, the situation is not uh, likely to change in a favorable way. Uh, not only for the minorities, I would say, but uh, simply for uh, each and all uh, the inhabitants of that country. Uh, we can uh, uh, go to the next uh, uh, speaker. Unfortunately, uh, Mrs. Monirek Suleimani, representative of the Balochi People's Party, has not been uh, able to join us today. And uh, uh, I would like to give the floor uh, instead to Mr. Baban Eliassi from the Center of Zagro to uh, explain. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, I, I will, be have, I will uh, have a short uh, uh, speech, uh, and in my speech I would like to uh, highlight uh, some of the uh, contradictions uh, exist in the Iranian constitution. Um, for example, uh, for the uh, presidential uh, election, uh, uh, we uh, see there is a total uh, constitutional uh, neglect of the uh, women and uh, uh, ethnic groups' rights. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran uh, population is composed of several national and religious minorities. Theoretically, the Iranian constitutional uh, formally provides for the fair treatment of its uh, minorities. In relation to the election process, the Iranian constitution discriminates explicitly the majority of its population, namely non-Persian nationals, non-Shia religious minorities, as well as women. For example, the Article uh, 12 of the constitution states the official religion of Iran is Islam and the 12 Jafari school of thought and this principle shall remain eternally immutable. Article uh, 115 of the Iranian constitution excludes explicitly non-Shia as well as women from holding the office of the presidency of the Republic of Iran. Under the current constitution, candidates for the office of the president must be political, religious men and faithful believers in the foundation of the Islamic Republic of Iran and official religion of the country. The Iranian constitution deprives citizens who hold political opinions contrary to that of the Islamic Republic of Iran and the women and um, uh, and the uh, country's official religion of the, uh, of the right to stand for president. No women and no Kurd or from other non-Shia national minorities candidate has been approved by the council by the Guardian Council in the f 34 years of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Therefore, this explicit endorsement of a school of Shia Islam alienates the Kurds, Turkmen, Baluch, and Ahwaz who practice Sunni Islam. Ladies and gentlemen, Tehran has a population of almost one million Sunni Muslims, but planning permission for a Sunni mosque has yet to be granted. I mean, since 34 years. However, 
the general comment on Article 25 is clear that political opinion may be not be used as a ground to deprive any person of the right to stand for election. Here I am talking about the uh, uh, article in the Covenant on the Political and Civil Rights that Iran is signatory. According to the declaration criteria for free and fair election to which I Iran is signatory, everyone has the right to take part in the government of their country and shall have an equal opportunity to become a candidate for election. The criteria for participation in government shall be determined in accordance with national constitutions and laws and shall not be inconsistent with the state's international obligations. According to the mentioned declaration, the state has the responsibility to provide for the formation and free functioning of political parties possibly regulate the founding of political parties and electoral campaigns, ensure the separation of party and state, and establish the conditions for competition in legislative election on an equi uh, equitable basis. Because of legal restrictions today, no Kurdish political party can have activities inside Iran and all Kurdish political parties are declared illegal inside and outside Iran. Therefore, the Kurdish political parties have no, no possibility to present candidates and no real Kurdish candidates will have the chance to be qualified by the Guardian Council, the organ that accredits the eligibility or not of the candidates. The special reporter on the situation of human rights in the Republic, Isla Republic Islamic of Iran in its report presented to the 22 session of the Human Rights Council expressed the concern regarding restrictions on the presidential in Iran and recalled the Article 25 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights which recognized <laughs> and protect the right of every citizen to take part in the conduct of public affairs, the right to vote and to be elected, and the right to have access to public services. Thank you. and holds a Master of Advanced Studies in Humanitarian Action specialized in international law. So, Mr. Ayassi, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Anthony. Very good afternoon to all. I'm not going to talk about elections, but about another issue, uh, which is the question of drug issue, uh, in, in, uh, which is used by the Islamic Republic of Iran uh, as a tool of repression and uh, political control. But b before I start my statement, I would like to show you this, this picture. Yeah. Uh, in this, uh, this, uh, this picture shows an, an event uh, in uh, January this, this year in, uh, in the town of Mahabad, is the historical capital of Kurdistan of Iran. Uh, According to Comedia, some uh, uh, security services like Etlaad uh, uh, put or skated in, in the street matchboxes like that containing uh, money, some amount of money and drugs, inviting uh, the, the, the Kurdish youth to, to, uh, uh, to uh, consume drugs. This, this, this is a campaign. This, this picture is a campaign by Kurdish media, so Facebook and whatever, to show, uh, to, to say that uh, th th this uh, another plan of the regime uh, to, uh, to to kill the Kurdish youth. Anyway, uh, 
Yes, indeed. Uh, as I said, I'm going to talk about the drug issue in Iran, uh, which is used by, by the government as a tool uh, 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 to, to repress the, the its opponents, uh, political activists, and uh, uh, members of religious and ethnic uh, nationalities in Iran. Uh, I am going to divide my uh, speech on, uh, on four parts, the first very, but very short. The fourth part is about the, the context of drug in Iran, and then I'm going to show that uh, Iran is using uh, the drug issue as a tool of repression, and then I'm going to talk also about the international aid, uh, so UN uh, to, to Iranian uh, drug policy, which ends with ex execution of its opponents, and also to conclude uh, my, my statement. Yeah. The Islamic Republic of Iran has seen a sharp increase in the number of drug addicts in the last three decades. Uh, out of a population of between uh, uh, 70 uh, and 80 million people, Iran has about 5 million hardcore addicts and 1 million of occasional users. Uh, according to uh, the head of Iran's anti-narcotics agency, uh, Messer Mokadam, Every year, more than one, uh, 103,000 persons become addicted in Iran. And uh, more than 75% of the hanging, uh, hangings in Iran are related to uh, drug uh, offenses or under, or under the cover of uh, drug uh, offenses. Also, the Iranian uh, government does not really provide stat statistics. According to UN Human Rights Committee and various uh, credible NGO reports, uh, most of the public execution for drug issue are taking place in minority uh, areas in Iran, and the victims are members of uh, religious and ethnic minorities and Afghan refugees also. Uh, the, the, uh, as I said, the Iranian, does not, uh, Iranian government does not provide uh, accurate, appropriate statis statistics about uh, executions, about the drug-related executions, about drug addicted, the numbers of drug addicts, and the latest serious comprehensive study on drug abuse taking into account, uh, in, into consideration the age, ethnicity, religious, and the geographical dimension in Iran was conducted in 1976 by the National Iranian Society for the Rehabilita Rehabilitation of the Disabled during the former Monarchy regime, regime, which saw that virtually all of the drug addicts were Shiite Muslims with a significant, I call this, all of the drug addicts were Shiite Muslims and uh, with a significantly larger minority of unregistered, uh, unregistered abusers being ethnic Turks. Under the Monarchy regime, the number of opium addicts was estimated at from 200,000 to 500,000, and the median age of the drug addicts was between age 55 and 64, and the major substance was opium. Well, today, however, Iran has the world worst heroin problem, and 80% of the drug users today are under 30 years old. The 1979 Islamic Revolution marked a new Islamic social order and a fundamental break in the approach to drug issue. Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, the, the leader of the revolution, the father of Iran's 79 revolution, blamed Iran's drug use on the decadence of the West. Consequ consequently, he ordered the end of all rehabilitation and drug maintenance programs and adopted a new policy. Uh, policy, uh, new policy. Henceforth, drug users were perceived and framed as deviants, dangers, significant other to the Islamic social order. Uh, and as evidence of foreign uh, conspiracies as well as a threat to the national security. The theorization of drug issue as a foreign conspiracy, the, scrutiniza the scrutinization and criminalization of drug offenders have led to the incarceration and execution of thousands of drug users. Since the Islamic Re Revolution in 79, over 10,000 drug users and dealers have been executed. Many of them hanged in public in, uh, in a focal display of state sovereignty, is a French uh, philosopher. Uh, now I'm going to show uh, that it is political. 
the, uh, the drug issue as a tool of repression and political control. The Iranian authority used a uh, drug issue to enforce its rule and repress ethnic nationalities and members of opposition groups. Whenever it faces escalate, escalating crisis internally or externally, new and harsher law, laws against drugs and uh, drug users are adopted, and public hangings of members of uh, ethnic and religious uh, groups increase dramatically. The following periods of hangings and drug laws illustrate this policy. The 1979 revolution period and the start of Iraq-Iran war. In May 1980, Ayatollah Sadiq al uh, many of my colleagues may remember him, the notorious revolutionary hanging judge in Tehran became the head of the anti-narcotic campaign and was put in charge of the purification of drug users, leading to hundred, hundreds of executions. Uh, these efforts were undertaken si si simultaneously with the outbreak of the Iran <coughs> Iraq war and the Cultural Revolution in of 1980-83. The second period is uh, uh, the end of the Iraq Iran war in 1988. After the ceasefire between Iraq and Iran in 1988, there was a massive increase of execution of drug users. Punishment for drug use and dealing were reinforced in October 1988, when the Assembly for Discerning the Interests of the System of the Islamic Republic issued a decree enforcing the death penalty for position, position of 30 grams of heroin and 5 grams of opium. I just want to remind you that uh, according to uh, Iranian anti-narcotic law, uh, using drugs, keeping, carrying, purchasing, distributing, hiding, transiting, uh, selling, importing, exporting are considered as crimes and the perpetrators, per per perpetrators more like English, shall be sentenced to, to the punishment prescribed in the law. Um, where was I? Sorry. Uh, at I'm going back to my uh, to my statement to, to the period of war in uh, a, at the end of the war 88. At that time, the national drug, drug headquarters, which monitors all drug-related policies, was established. In the period between January and July 1989, 900 drug offenders were executed under the new law. Furthermore, the hanging uh, the hangings of the drug users followed closely the 1988 wave of executions of political prisoners. These crackdowns and repression on drug users as well as opposition activists, especially, especially the member of ethnic minorities and religious groups, uh, sorry, religious minorities, were legitimized with references to both moral deprivation and national security. <coughs> Ahmadi Najad's uh, re-election period the period before and after the contested re-election of Ahmadinejad uh, has also seen an increase of the public hangings. This was also followed by, re by a reinforcement of the law on drug use. As uh, an author on Iranian drug, uh, Christensen put, uh, Iran's drug crisis bring together a number of disparate policies, discourses, and go governmental actors conducting what uh, Michel Foucault, the French philosopher, would call a strategic control of the population. This, of course, had, has had substantial neg negative impacts in regard to the affected minority groups. According to Human Rights Watch, 70% of the execution in 2011 were drug-related. However, the Iranian leaders not only used internally the drug issue to repress the political activists and the minorities, but they also use in it internationally to seek collaboration of Western countries and the UN, as they are aware of the potential benefits for, of this. For instance, it was through the dr drug discourse that President Khatami launched a dialogue between civilizations during the opening of uh, an office of UN ODC, is the UN uh, uh, drug, drug office, uh, in Tehran in 2008. Furthermore, the securitization of the drug issue has been used as a venue for, a venue for dialogue with the West by the regime. Irre irrespective of the fact that the Iranian authorities in their public discourses bla blames, blame Western countries and most absurdly the Zionist Jews for the, their supposed involvement in the spread of drug in the Iran, 
For instance, in June 25, 2012, during an international and UN anti drug conference in Tehran, the Iranian Vice President Mahmoud Raza Rahimi stated that the Talmud, a sacred, a sacred text of Judaism, was responsible for the spread of illegal drugs around the world. Once again, the Iranian authorities used on anti Semitism to defend themselves and to draw the attention on external factors in order to make others responsible for the problems they cause in Iran. I'm going to talk, the last point is about UN and inter international community aid to Iran's drug policy. Internationally, the Islamic Republic of Iran is a party to the 98 United Nations Drug Convention, and it benefits from, from UN and inter international mechanisms and instruments to combat dr drug trafficking. Currently, Iran is benefiting from a program spon sponsored by the United Nations Office on Drug and Crimes and the European Union Presidency. Despite the criminalization of the drug addicts and the multiple programs supported by the international community to fight against drug problems, the above mentioned statistics show that the drug victims increased dramatically since the last three decades of the rule of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Regarding the international and UN aid to Iran, according to OCDE, the Iranian government has received 556 million of uh, international financial aid in the last between two, 2007 and two, two, uh, 2011. It is also important to highlight that under the Islamic Re Republic of Iran's regulation on civil society, receiving any financial aid from foreigners are strictly prohibited and all of the foreign aid should be deliver delivered through governmental channel. Yeah, I just conclude with this, I, I, I cut my speech. Um, the drug policy and approach which allows the execution of drug offenders constitute an undeniable violation of international law, particularly Article, Article 6 of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, on the right to life to which Iran is a treaty party. The international community must respond to this situation as one of the worst abuses of this penalty, especially with its focus on oppressing the ethnic and religious groups in Iran. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. became very close to the execution. Then uh, she came to Canada in 1991, where she still lives today. And uh, her uh, uh, memoir of her life in Iran, Prison of, of Tehran, published in Canada in 2007, has been published in 28 other countries, and there's been an international bestseller. So, uh, Marina, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, first of all, please allow me to thank all of my fellow panelists. Uh, it has been a pleasure and an honor to get to know you and to hear your thoughts. And I more or less agree with everything that, that, that you have said. And please allow me to mention that I have some Kurdish, uh, some Azari, and some Russian background. And I'm a Christian, and I have Baha'i family members. So according to the government of Iran, it doesn't get much worse than this. So uh, thank you so, so much for giving me your time. Um, I am speaking not so much as um, a writer that I am or as a political activist that I guess I have become, but I am speaking as a witness, which I think it is important. We need to acknowledge the crimes against humanity that the current regime in Iran has committed and we cannot downplay them. So I think the role of bearing witness is an important one. And it makes the matter urgent, and it reminds us why this is even important. I was born in 1965 in Tehran, Iran. Back then, it was the reign of the Shah. I was born in a Christian family who was absolutely not political. My father was a ballroom dancing instructor in Tehran. Yeah. And my mother was a hairdresser, so I grew up between the sounds of the cha-cha and the tango and women with really big poofy hair. And politics were the f was the furthest thing uh, from our minds. Growing up in Iran, we had a cottage by the Caspian. I spent my summers 
dancing to the tunes of the Bee Gees, watching the Donnie and Mary Osmond show, and the little house on the prairie dubbed into Farsi. And uh, then it was in, you know, so, you know, I, I had grown up a very Western kind of life. And then in 1978, we get back home from the cottage and in my normal neighborhood in downtown Tehran on Shah Avenue at the intersection of Sheikh Hadi, where, you know, it was downtown Tehran, skyscrapers, scrapers, people going shopping and just basically doing what people do. There was a tank parked at my door. I had no idea what was going on. I had never heard the name Ayatollah Khomeini. I had never heard that there was even a movement against the Shah, but there it was. So we returned to school after, you know, after the success of the revolution. I'm not going to get into the details of that. And uh, the world had literally turned on its head. And in school, at the beginning, it was great. I mean, it took a while for the Islamic Republic to write its constitution. So for a while, we had some freedom of speech, and of course, we enjoyed that. But it didn't last very long, as you might imagine. So the wave of arrest of young people, uh, of teenagers in Iran began in 1981. Um, in my school, Anshirvan Dadgar, most of us were very outspoken. Why? We because we had grown up during the time of the Shah. We had uh, lived through a revolution that had promised the people of Iran freedom and equality and democracy. There wasn't much talk of Sharia law back then, and then it had not delivered. Not only we had not gained any personal, uh, any um, political freedoms, but we had lost our personal ones. So dancing became illegal, singing became illegal, having fun became illegal. So as a normal 14 year old, I was very upset that I was not allowed to wear bikinis. I was very upset that I was not able to watch the Donnie and Marie Osmond show. And many of my friends, the majority of my friends, we are talking 14 year olds here, they were in the same boat. Yes, some of us supported some uh, far left or far right poli political groups, but in the core of it, all we wanted was to have political and personal freedoms which the revolution had taken away. And then the wave of arrest began. So every day you would go to school and there would be one or two desks empty. I wasn't one of the first ones arrested. I was arrested in 1982, and uh, they came for me at home the same way that they came for most of my friends. Now, how were these lists accumulated? You know, the list of the names of the people who were eventually arrested. This was the beginning of the Iranian Cultural Revolution. So the new principal in my school that was appointed by the new regime, uh, she was 18 years old. She was a member of the newly formed Revolutionary Guard. And it took her about basically a year to accumulate a list of the names of students in my school, all of them teenagers who had done activities against the government. That meant anybody who had expressed opinions that was in contrast with the ones of the Islamic Republic of, of Iran in any shape or form, in any severity. So there were about 50 names <coughs> on that list and they came for all of us gradually. I was arrested on January 15, 1982. I was about to take a bath, the door of a rank, and there were the Revolutionary Guard, and they took me to Evin Prison. I was 16 years old. Upon arrival, I was taken out in a long hallway after hallway after hallway, taken for interrogation. Of course, I was 16, very innocent and very naive. They asked me questions, have you attended rallies? I told the truth, yes, yes, I have attended. Have you written articles against the government? I told the truth, yes, I have written articles against the government. I had no reason to lie. I was not trying to hide anything. I had done everything in public. I was not a member of any political organizations. I had supported many of them, but I was not a member in any shape or form. And then they wanted the whereabouts of a girl that I had no idea where she was. I didn't have her address. If I did, I probably would have given it to them right there and then because I was pretty scared. So then they took me to another room and they took off my blindfold. I was alone in a room with two men, Ali and Hamid. They took off my, they had taken off my blindfold so I could actually see what's going on here. And we were in a small room with a desk and two chairs and a bare wooden bed. And they asked me again about the whereabouts of that girl. Her name was Shahzad. I said, I have no idea. So they handcuffed me. And when they handcuffed me, they saw my hands are going to come out of the cuffs easily because I was 95 pounds back then and 16 years old. So they put both of my wrists in one cuff. And as it clicked, my right wrist cracked. 
and the torture had not even begun yet. Now, at that point, I realized I'm no torture material. So if I knew anything, anything that could get me out of that room, if they wanted me to confess to anything in any shape or form, I would have done it. If the devil appeared and asked me to sell my, my soul, I would have sold my soul, but that was not an option. So they tied me to the bare wooden bed. They, were, they took off my socks and my shoes, and I had Puma running shoes. I had just bought them, never saw them again. And they tied me very securely, and they, they lashed the soles of my feet with a length of cable. The favorite method of torture, of course, they, they, they don't call it torture in Irin, they call it tazir, but um, it is torture. They tied me to the bare wooden bed, and they lashed the soles of my feet for, I don't know, what seemed like an eternity to me. And with every strike of the lash, my nervous system would explode. Then it would be magically put back together and I would be wide awake for the next strike. It is a space of distilled, pure pain. If you think you know what pain is, but you haven't experienced that one, then I think you might be very much wrong. That is a place of absolute darkness. That is a place of absolute suffering. Again, if I could have said anything, anything to get me out of that room, I would have. But the problem is that they kept on beating me without even asking me any questions. They didn't give me time to even breathe. So they just kept on beating. It seemed that, it seemed that there was no purpose to it. It was just about inflicting pain. Eventually they stopped and uh, I looked at my feet and I laughed because they looked like party balloons with toes on them and color was indigo blue. Now, I think the good question that can be asked here is, what is the purpose of torture? At least the purpose of torture in Islamic Republic because that is where I have experienced it. Those who use torture might tell you that it is to get information, they lie. Torture is not designed to, break, to get information. Torture is designed to break the human soul. And that is what they were trying to do. We had mass executions every single night. If they wanted to kill you, they would put you in front of a firing squad. They wouldn't torture you. Torture is for another reason. As I said, it is to kill the human soul. It is to break you. And they are not only trying to break you per se, they are trying to break your family, they are trying to break com your community, and they are trying to break the country. And guess what? It worked. So I was sent to the cell block, you know, I'm not gonna get into the details of the conditions because the conditions were simply horrific. So, you know, we were always hungry. They were drugging us. There were horrible things happening every single night. There were mass executions, and we had to live through all of that. I'm not going to get into detail. I have written the details of it. And every, almost every single night, and, you know, 90% of us were under the age of 20. So high school in hell. Every single night, there, you know, there, they would call. I was in 246, cell block 246. Uh, they would call two, three, four, five names, and they would take these girls like at 11 p.m., and they would return them to the cell block at 5 or 6 a.m. at around the time of the morning prayer. So if you knew the girl, you would go to her, and, you know, she would come seemingly intact with no signs of torture, apparently. So you would go to her, and you would just, in a friendly way, ask her, so where were you last night? And she would give you some lame excuse, like, oh, they took me for interrogation, nothing happened. Yeah, right, that doesn't happen around here. They take you for interrogation, they do something really nasty to you. That doesn't happen around here. But then she would give you that look that said, get lost, I don't want to talk about it, so you would get lost because you respected your friend. And I guess we were all wondering about what was going on, but nobody, and let's not forget we were all 15, 16 year olds, ever dared ask anything because in Evin prison you don't ask questions you answer them so I was called for interrogation about five months after my arrest my interrogator Ali was there he looked at me straight in the eye and he said listen carefully he said you had a death sentence I reduced it to life in prison you're going to be here forever and nobody cares and that much I had figured it was pretty obvious that the world had abandoned us, that the world didn't care at all what was going to happen to thousands and thousands of teenage Iranians who were being tortured and executed in Evin prison. Oh well, that much I knew. 
and I was living with it. Then he said, you have to become my wife or I will arrest your parents and your boyfriend. Hmm. I thought about it. I had seen family members in Evin prison before, people who had done nothing but they, they were there simply because one of their family members had done something wrong. So I thought about it and I said, fine, I'll do it. And he said, you have to convert to Islam. I said, fine, I'll do it. And he even changed my name. So one day I looked around me, I had lost my freedom, my family, my religion, and my dignity. How much more can you take away from a human being before they completely crumble to dust? I don't think a whole lot more. So I asked him to move me to solitary confinement. Now you have to be out of your mind to want to move to solitary confinement. But the problem was that if you returned me to the cell block, what would I tell my friends? That I slept with my interrogator last night? I don't think so. So I moved to 209 section of Evin prison in solitary. I was being raped at the age of 17 over and over again by my so-called husband that had been forced on me at the age of 17, and it was absolutely legal according to Iranian law, and there was nothing I could do about it. So I spent most of my day either sleeping or reading the Quran, which was the only available book, and I was unaware of this. But one of the priests from my church actually brought a copy of the Bible to the prison gates to be delivered to me, and they refused to give it to me. So here we were. And this went on and on and on. Again, I don't want to get into all the details uh, because more, all of the details are in my books and in my interviews. But what I want to really come to a com conclusion here is that we have been talking about the Iranian elections. We have been talking about the fact that the Iranian regime cannot sustain itself. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist. We see that dictatorships fall. So the, to me, that is not so much of a question. You know, of course, the, the elections in Iran are a scam. They are a masquerade. The green, mo green movement is a joke. Because Mr. Musavi, um, who became the so-called leader of this green movement, he, b he was the prime minister when I was in prison and when most of my friends were executed. So excuse me, but Mr. Musavi did have an opportunity to stand up and do the right thing. And he very consciously chose not to do anything about it. So please forgive me if I have absolutely zero respect for him. But I can understand the people of Iran that they are so desperate that they would even try to hang on to Musavi to get out of this whole terrible situation they are in, but he is not the answer. And I think one of the main reasons that the whole Green Movement did not succeed was that it had terrible leadership, it had terrible ideas, and of course it didn't include all of the Iranian people. That include the Azari and the Baluch and etc. and etc. They include the Baha'i, they include the Christians, they, they include the Jewish, and none of that came about. Uh, so I believe that yes, the, the Islamic Republic will fall. Now that will be sooner or it will be, will be later. You know, I, I'm not, you know, again, I don't have a crystal ball, but it will happen. But the question for me is what will come after that? That is the main question for me because uh, I think we face serious challenges. Looking at the Iranian opposition, again, I'm no politician and I, I have never claimed to be, but looking at the opposition, I think we have big challenges. Uh, we have to try to get along with each other. We have to try to come to the understanding that the, the Iran in the future that would be able to even remotely include all of the ethnic groups and all of the religious groups needs to be an Iran that has a constitution that's, that is not based on any religion or any ideology. In the future, we need, after the Islamic Republic falls, we need an Iran that respects every single human being who lives in that country, every single human being who has ever lived in that country, regardless of their religion, of their political ideology, of their color of skin, or the language that they speak. So we have big challenges. And I think one of the issues that has been, again, disappointing for me is all of the uh, infighting within the opposition. And it is disturbing, and it gets in the way of getting things done. And I think we really need to sit down, put, it, put all of these petty differences that uh, most of them come from misunderstandings or from hatred or from uh, the kinds of pressure that the Islamic Republic has put on, of, uh, on all of us. And we all suffer from the psychological aftermath of it. I, I mean, I never claim I'm a normal person. I'm definitely not normal at all. I mean, how can you go through that and be normal? 
it just doesn't happen. So, but we need to acknowledge all of that and we need to sit down and we need to talk about it. And we need to have a clear plan that includes everybody because I know some plans do exist, but they exclude and demonize certain parts of the Iranian population, whether because of their ethnic background or political background or whatever. So we need to find a way to put all of that aside. Thank you so, so much for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Irina, for uh, your uh, passion to witness, which is also uh, full of, uh, indeed, uh, uh, political uh, ideas. Because uh, when you said that uh, you need uh, an Iran that uh, respects any single individual who lives uh, in that country, regardless of uh, religion, uh, ethnicity, or, or whatever, this is uh, indeed uh, what uh, we, the, the politicians, uh, the experts in international law, let's say, uh, should always be striving for. So uh, thank you very much. Now we have uh, just a few minutes for a short break, and then we'll ask uh, uh, Dr. Haji Mohammed uh, Sor, a, regional, uh, a Turkmen from uh, Iran and Turkmenistan, currently living in Canada, and a member of the Iranian Turkmenistan Human Rights Defense Organization, uh, to take the floor. So just some few minutes will take. And uh, Turkmen is also uh, same as well as other uh, ethnic minor minority groups in Iran has uh, uh, facing a lot of uh, <coughs> uh, discrimination and uh, 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 that uh, pro prejudices. Uh, Turkmen are mainly living in the uh, northeastern shores of Caspian Sea up to the uh, borders of, of uh, Afghanistan. And despite they have uh, at least 70% uh, of population in their uh, provinces, but uh, they do not have any right to <coughs> participate in affairs and uh, the decisions get uh, the concern to their uh, province. And uh, Turkmen, also uh, by, by this regime, uh, they, their uh, discrimination is uh, uh, double because they are Sunni Muslims, and uh, just uh, now in front of, in front of that uh, uh, president election, Turkmen now have any right to participate, and uh, they give their candidature to that uh, participate in the and un enroll in the uh, presidential election. <coughs> and that also that uh, discrimination uh, uh, in all spheres of uh, their life is uh, continuing. They don't have uh, any right in um, teach and uh, uh, in schools and uh, speak mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. in their languages, in their mother tongue, uh, in the schools. And uh, the government is uh, <coughs> confiscating their lands and planned lands uh, in order to, in sake of uh, uh, constructing new projects. But uh, and uh, yeah, the government give no any right to do controlling and work in these projects. Uh, government moving other people from other pr provinces uh, to control the uh, uh, overall the government's plan to change the populations uh, in uh, Turkmen Sahara and uh, and uh, and uh, do not give any rights to control their living provinces uh, 
Turkmen ethnic groups as well as other uh, ethnic groups in Iran, uh, there uh, we have to acknowledge that uh, their uh, their uh, rights are <coughs> violated, and uh, it's continuing. Uh, it's doubled by that uh, uh, that uh, regime of uh, Islamic group of led by Ahmadinejad, and, and tripled almost because they don't have any rights. Uh, to participate in even in their province, uh, everything. We do not want to, <laughs> we are rejecting to violate. We want peace, we want to live in peace, uh, in same, uh, in same uh, rights with other peoples, other nations, and every people in the Iran. Uh, we want to have the uh, same right with them. Uh, and. Uh, Conclusion, uh, just uh, I get informed just <laughs> about a couple, a couple of hours ago, I, without any preparation before than that. And uh, in the end, I want, uh, <coughs> conclusion, I want to uh, cordially appreciate uh, from the Nonviolence Radical Party to allow me to uh, participate and uh, express the Turkmen's difficulties in every daily affairs and and uh, religious uh, rituals affairs uh, appreciate and tell them thank you thank you for everything thank you we have two more questions in English uh, I don't know if there is uh, any other wisdom to take the floor for a brief uh, intervention or for some questions to our panelists I want also to, to remind uh, that uh, this is Mamiraki Kelemani who has not been able to come here. So get Mr. Chairman, thank you to you all who are here for the Iranian minority problem. We have not only the Iranian minority problem, we have all Iranian citizen rights problem that include the Iranian minorities as the most important, one of the most important problem. I'm very glad to see some of the famous face of my very nice mosaic peoples, nations of Iran. I am not from the minority. I am coming from a city near center of Iran named Brujev in Lorestan, but I am not Lor. I have been fight for all the Iranian people's rights during more than 14 years old. Not only for the Iranian peoples, even for the Arab, Palestinian, Zofarian, and all Turkish, when was Turkey under the military coup d'etat people in 17s, I was fighting against this military who have uh, provided the peoples of Turkey, all the people of the Turkey from their basic Rise. I am very glad to see you, my uh, citizenship, friendly citizen. I am in the same time Kurd, Kurdish Sadakum. I am in the same time Arab, Atahad Nasubi Lugal Arabiya, 
واتحدى حدا يستطيع ان يتحدث كما انا ولا يوجد ولا يوجد حدا كانت تشارك في ثوره وفي حركه الشعب العربي في كل المنطقه مثلما انا زربي كردكان بزانن امن لا لا اوان بوم لا بيشوا جمهوري اسلامي دا مزانبي هورياني غوري من كبدس جمهوري اسلامي لا فيينا وكو دكتور غاسمو لا اتينا وكو كيشافارس شهيد كران اوانا هموي هولايتي من بوم the Baha'ian, the feminist movement of Iran, the all who's fighting for liberty in Iran and for human fundamental rights, now that I personally and my comrades were every time in their side. In the same time that I thank you for inviting these num numbers of the symbolic flowers of my jardin, of my garden. I am very sorry that re there is a lot of Epson here. The no believer that I am, I am a citi citizen of Iran. At the same time, I am not believer to any religion. I am not defend from any uh, special national movement. There, there is in this salon the people, the person who was in the leadership of a German a student movement. I see here even another feminist and all the Iranian that can complete our mosaic. Thank you very much, and I am really glad to be uh, invited here to give you this speech. Thank you. political party, transnational interest party, we do the same. So thank you for coming here and uh, let's be in contact and uh, see each other very soon. Thank you. Thank you.